Greetings, I'm Dr. Park jung of Hyo Dental Clinic. Today, I want to talk about a case where I placed the implants through Crestle approach. Let's look at patient image at initial visit. The patient is 61-year-old male patient and number 14, 15, 16, and 24, 25, 26, and 27 are missing. Number 14 and 16 surgery was done ahead. And today I want to talk about placing implants in number 24, 25, 26, and 27. The residual bone for number 24 and 27 look okay. Number 25 and 26. Especially in number 26, residual bones seem to be lacking. There was a septum and there was also inclination. Number 26 looked somewhat more favorable compared to number 25, which had distal inclination. In number 26, there was mesial inclination, so this was of concern as well. When doing crestal approach in inclined areas, in one part, it can be penetrated, but for the rest of it, there can still be no penetration. So it's very difficult to determine if the sinus floor has been penetrated or not. The best way to do it is to do it gradually, moving forward by one millimeters using hydro lift. You need to be very patient, and this can be a very tenacious job. Patience is the key here. This is something that needs to be concentrated on when doing implant surgery. If you look at intraoral image, the bone width looks sufficient. I don't think it's going to be a problem in doing flapless surgery. If you look at CT, the sinus floor does not look fairly even. There is a little bit of less residual bone here, but this is not going to be a problem in doing crestal approach. Guide was included in the treatment plan. If you look at the guide design, this shows everything we need to know about residual bone. This shows minimum and maximum distance up to the inferior margin of the sinus from the implant to top. we can anticipate the basic numbers. Also, a guide is presented following these numbers as to how we should drill. You can look at this document and proceed with surgery in a very safe manner. In flat areas, it's not very difficult to perform surgery, but in sloped regions, there can be a bit of difficulties. If you're doing crystal approach for the first time, it is better to approach it from the flat area rather than sloped area. If you're experienced, it doesn't matter where. This is the image of how the guide was adapted. The implants were placed. ISQ level were good. If you take a look at the surgical clip, I'm sure you'd be able to see it, but I continued to do one millimeter drilling and then put in water. When you put in water with guide on, at times, the water cannot go in properly, so you need to take off the guide and then put it back on. You need to gradually progress through the treatment. Such may seem simple, but you need to be very careful. This is how it looks after implant placement. Implants were placed nicely. You need to check whether implants have been placed properly within the sinus. On CT, you can see that in number 24, it looks great. It means that something's gone wrong. 
in number 24, I used a one guide drill, 8.5 one guide drill for the final time. There was no sense of sinus floor penetration then. I used one guide drill to place the originally planned 4.5 by 8.5 implant, but sinus floor was not penetrated. That was how number 24 was placed. Gradual drilling was done, and when I did aspiration, I assumed that the membrane was not uh, penetrated and placed the implant. Bleeding was observed, hence, I thought sinus membrane lift was done properly and placed the implant. In number 26, I checked whether there was a membrane penetration and I thought that membrane lift was done nicely in number 27 when I did a drilling up to number 26 membrane was lifted properly in number 27 there was a sufficient residual bone so I wasn't really stressed to hear Following the plan, drilling was done and implant was placed. After surgery, when I checked the CT, membrane was completely perforated. Upon surgery, when I did aspiration, there were no bubbles, so I thought that sinus lift was done properly and I put in alloplastic LCR material. However, you could see here that sinus membrane perforation occurred. This is after treatment in the bottom. About four months later, I completed the treatment. The sinus looks clean. When we do sinus surgery, we need to do diagnosis properly as to whether osteum is blocked or whether it has patency. We need to look at the contour of sinus membrane and the thickness of it. We also need to consider whether there is possibility of the osteum being blocked. If you look at pre-op image, there is patency in osteum. Sinus membrane was perforated and graft material was put in, but fortunately healing was done nicely. If the osteum is blocked or if there is irregularity in sinus membrane, or excessively thick membrane, you can come across the significant difficulties. In number 24, there was a sufficient residual bone, so it will be maintained without a problem. The implant was placed in number 25, and you can see that there is a significant contact between the residual bone and implant. Over about two-thirds of the implant is in contact with the residual bone. So I think the prognosis would be nice. It's the same with number 27. There was quite significant residual bone, but the problem is with number 26. It had least amount of residual bone. This is a 7 millimeter implant and you can see that about half is in contact with the residual bone. It's between 3 to 4 millimeters. When load is applied on implant, at around 4 or 5 millimeters, load is concentrated there. If you look at the references for successful sinus surgery, there is difference in success rate using 5 mm as a standard. If a sinus augmentation of 1 to 2 mm could be possible, it could be successful. If we could regenerate 1 to 2 mm of bone more around this implant, I think this implant could be nicely maintained. 
currently the patient is without any symptom and the treatment was completed and I think we need to follow up and see what happens. As for the surgical process, please refer to the clip. Thank you.
네, 신예비. 
1.5 돌, 7 돌. 맞아. 맞아요. 